So this, this is going to be more food for thought, but also more fun and, um, and, yeah, hopefully a really nice reflective way to end the day. So we're going to talk about what does culture and societal engagement with AI look like. Um, so I promise to tell you a bit more about British Science Association. Um, and we're really concerned with the public and what the public think about issues like AI, but lots of other um, areas of science and technology in, in the broader sense. So basically what I'm talking about is if all of us stood up, walked out of this room right now onto Euston Road and each chose someone to go and talk to and uh, try and talk to them about everything we've spoken about so far today, so artificial intelligence and bioscience, and to find out what their responses are, what their questions are, whether they've ever thought about this before and what they think it might mean to their lives. And to me, that's really interesting and stimulating um, and a worthwhile thing to do. I think there's probably so much uh, surprising stuff that we could learn. It was really interesting hearing Anna talk earlier about working with pet owners and how that's influenced their products. I think that's just the beginning um, of the opportunity that comes from talking to the public. So our mission is to basically to support science uh, as, a broader, as part of broader society and culture. Um, and to us, that means making it open to question, um, making it a cultural activity, so something that people feel can be creative and enjoyable, and also reflective and representative of society as a whole. Um, and that's really what we're going to talk about each of the panelists today. We'll take one of those uh, kind of slants on artificial intelligence and bioscience and just give a, give a short um, point of view on what that means to them, and then there'll be a chance for you to ask questions and reflect on your own work, perhaps, as well. So first of all, I'm going to hand straight over to, to Margaret. Uh, do, do I, is this switched on or do I have to, I can't. No, it's fine, it's on. It's on. It's on. Okay. I'd like to say two things first. Um, I've much enjoyed today, but I agreed with virtually every word of the previous speaker. <laughs> and I agreed with virtually every word of John Fox. And I'm going to follow John Fox's example by concentrating on AI in the clinical context. Now, as regards medical diagnosis, and for that matter, bioscientific research, it's absolutely obvious, it seems to me, that the potential from AI in general and machine learning in particular is huge, massive, uh, and also huge, although smaller, because of various complicating factors for prognosis including the prediction of um, survival rates and of side effects. But the issue which you raised about, you know, when is a sister, the AI sister just offering you a recommendation and should you take it? And when is it actually enabled to make the choice? I think that's very important in this area. And I think there are some problems that people um, often don't think about. I mean, for example, take survival rates. Um, you give somebody a prognosis, how long they're going to live, even if they've asked you. They don't actually necessarily want to know. And doctors know this very well. They understand this very well. And um, so should you actually answer that question? And if you answer it and the person is clearly in denial, do you then sort of repeat it and drum it into them? I've actually got a personal friend at the moment for whom this is a very, very real issue. Her husband will not accept the uh, diagnosis and it's a big problem. Um, so survival rates, uh, yes, an AI could predict them, but would the clinician actually want to communicate that information. Side effects, well, I mean, different people respond very differently to different side effects. Imagine a side effect which gave somebody a f what many people might call a fairly minor facial disfigurement. 
Now, some people just would not be prepared to accept that. They would go through any amount of pain in order to avoid that. Other people wouldn't. And in general, the quality of life, uh, don't ask me to, to define that, but we all know <laughs> what I mean. The quality of life is hugely important. And people differ so much on what they think that the quality of life, quality of life is and what it involves and what their compromises they're prepared to make. Now, all of that stuff has to be decided by the patient, has to be discussed, one hopes, with the doctor. But how could you discuss those sorts of issues with a machine, even if it's a hybrid machine, which I entirely agree with, John, we're going to need. Uh, how could you discuss that with an AI system in any meaningful fashion? I mean, people, a couple of people today have referred to natural language processing and reasoning and um, said, in effect, you know, quite rightly, we're not very far on in, in those areas yet, although much further than we thought we would be, perhaps, a few years ago. Well, I think perhaps the most superficially compelling example is Watson. That's also been referred to, but I don't mean Watson in its uh, version that's dealing with cancer diagnosis. I mean the, the version of Watson, I think it was the very first version actually, which was built to play Jeopardy and which uh, beat the two human champions of, uh, of Jeopardy at the game. Now, is there anybody here who doesn't know what Jeopardy is? Okay, you all know. So as you know then, this thing uh, came up with uh, in effect, answers to questions. They were more like puzzles, though, than straightforward questions. That's what Jeopardy is. Came up with answers to questions, which in many cases were initially extremely compelling. Um, but I'll just give you one example. The thing at one point, Watson was in effect asked to name the two of Jesus' disciples whose, name ended in the whose names ended in the same letter and were popular baby names. And because Watson had in it, I mean, this wasn't cheating, it already had in it and always does, um, recent and, for that matter, older versions of the New York Times. And of course, the New York Times includes lists of baby names, at least once a year. Um, so it was able to answer this question, and the answer it gave was Andrew and Matthew, which is correct. And the two human beings that it was pitted against also both got Andrew and Matthew. But one of them said, you know, the first names I thought of were James and Judas. And then I thought, oh, well, I, I, know. I don't think it's very likely somehow that Judas is a popular baby's name. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? Watson could not have picked that up. Think of what you have to know to know that. I mean, you all laughed, well, all of you, many of you did. You clearly understood the point. Of course you had to know the story. You have to be a Christian, but you have to know the story. But then Watson knows the story. It's got the Bible in there too, okay? No problem about knowing the story. Why is it that Judas is not a popular name? And in order to answer that question, you have to answer this one. What actually is going on? What is being done when somebody names a baby? What are you doing when you pick a name for your baby? What are you doing such that you're very unlikely to pick the name Judas? Now, we all understand this because on the one hand, we have a huge amount of world knowledge. 
which is not included, and I would suggest would never be included within Watson's database, but even more to the point, we all share the human condition. We all know what it is to have hopes for a baby, to bring a new life into the world, and to give a name which in some sense expresses our values about something or other. And it certainly is not likely to express a high valuation of betrayal. And we all know what betrayal is and why we think it's a bad thing, does Watson? Could it? Could any other AI system know that? That's just one example. We could give lots of others. In other words, what I'm suggesting is, when you go to your doctor to suggest, not just to get a diagnosis, which certainly AI can help with, but when you go to get a suggestion, not just a prognosis, but a suggestion for treatment, what to do now, what if anything to do, perhaps to refuse all treatment, but if not, then what treatment to take, very often, not always of course, but very often, those sorts of personal human issues come up. I talked about the quality of life. Um, you, can, uh, you can make up the story for yourself of a family in which, because of some personal issue, personal relationship within the family, depending perhaps on a particular aspect of the history of one of the family members, a particular treatment which normally would be regarded as the obvious treatment and which most people would immediately say, yes, yeah, let's do that, that sounds good, that a person might say to their doctor, no, I don't want to do that. Isn't there something else we can do instead? Now, all those sorts of issues are the sorts of things that come up, if you've got a decent doctor, that come up in conversations with the doctor, especially important ones, medically important ones. And they're not things which could come up with an AI system, or rather, they could come up with certain sorts of AI systems, but they certainly couldn't be handled properly. Um, so uh, I think that this whole area is hugely exciting. I think there are great benefits that can come from it, and, that, and some of which have already come. So I have no problems with saying that, but I also want to repeat what you said, that there are dangers here and we should be worried about them and we should be thinking about them. Quite what we do about them, I don't know. <laughs> but they're there. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to pass straight over to, to Genevieve, who's going to... It's going to be very different. It's going to be... I think you're all sitting a little bit too comfortably. Um, yes. <laughs> we've talked about AI and uh, bioscience as something that can be functional, but Genevieve's going to talk about it as something that can be cultural. And artistic. Uh, and artistic, yeah. yes. So, um, so this is me in an infographic. Um, and again, this is all about communication, but I'm, I'm much more than those things. Um, a lot of people um, will talk to me and sort of, um, one of the things I'm gonna talk about is why I've included electronically enhanced. So um, what I do for my work as the entrepreneur, I run a company called Ready Salted Code and it's a uh, not-for-profit company uh, designed for creative computer science education. And I produce classical ballets about computer science theory and concepts. The latest one is Pain Bite. This is a picture um, showing algorithms and data streams from weather data, um, uh, from Datastorm. The latest one, which comes out and I'll talk about a little bit more about, is called Pain Bite, and that's about chronic pain and biomedical engineering. It's quite a personal one, and you'll hear why. So one of the things that we like to talk about um, is all of you today have spoken in very highly technical terms, Everybody out there can't understand what you're saying, but you want them to because they need to understand for like the, like the last speaker said and also when John was saying, the idea of that, if they don't understand the technical and the ideas and the dangers and the benefits of things like biomedical engineering and also artificial intelligence, they won't be able to um, engage with you. So I use the medium of classical ballet to actually inform the audience um, about things like algorithms and binary tree structures, and we use lots of things like connect data and biometric data. So, pain bite. This image automatically gives you and evokes an emotional response. That's what my body feels like every day, all day, nonstop. Sometimes it varies on how much pain I have, and sometimes, um, uh, hence I walk with a stick, 
Um, but a lot of people um, see it's an invisible disability and you don't see it. The same as what you could say about the rise of the AI um, in the world. So this is the choreographer and she's got um, implanted technology. So she also has just rods, whereas I have something called a high frequency spinal cord stimulator and this is implant number two. Um, so one of the things, why did I go for this implant as opposed to the myriad of drugs that I've been on since I was 11? Because I couldn't think, I couldn't code, um, it actually had a huge impact. Talking about the side effects, I, I literally, it was like a sweet shop of try this drug, try that drug, try this one. So I went for a drug-free option. And obviously from my background of, te of teaching computing, I actually wasn't afraid of having the implanted technology um, which a lot of people are. I mean, it is weird having something inside your body, it, no matter how cool you think it is to be able to call yourself cyborg. So, and it is, that's my job title as chief cyborg at Ready Solid Code, because if you can't have fun of yourself, who can you? Um, so one of the things that's really interesting about this is um, my device is the equivalent of an Arduino with an extension cord and some electrodes right next to the spinal cord. Obviously, it's not that, because I wouldn't want to put an Arduino inside me. <laughs> um, so this is, this is a protected device. Um, so we talk about open source stuff, and I, uh, with the developer community, they're like, oh, can we get some data off it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> um, as much as it would be cool, you're not touching it, and you're not coming anywhere near it. So this is where I would be afraid of an AI controlling my implant. So on a personal level, when we talk about the... So obviously, I have to have a firmware update every 12 to 18 months, like literally the same as a computer. Um, and that's done via sort of induction charging. Um, would I want a sort of AI doing that over the waves? Um, you know, here's your, here's your, what, get, get to your local Wi-Fi hotspot and make sure you can do your update. I don't think so at the moment. I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. So again, so I used an artist to then from my x-ray to create this. This is less intimidating for the general public when you want to talk and engage with them about biomedical engineering and about the, also the subject of chronic pain. Because um, obviously you're awake when they implant this, when they do the operation. You're fully awake and they have to talk to you. So when you're talking about things that seem very uh, um, difficult and um, scary, rise of the machines, Terminator stuff, um, having imagery that feels more comfortable to them is one way of engaging with them, So, which is why I engaged uh, an artist and researcher, Claire, to do it. And she talks about um, how um, some of the, uh, again, the symbolism that you can get. And one of the things that we've done with chronic pain is instead of taking a VR from a therapeutic point of view, we've actually taken a VR experience from a storytelling point of view to see if you can you put yourself in the foot um, of a chronic pain sufferer without any of you actually suffering pain. There's no way I'd want anyone to ever feel what I feel. So for what we've done is we've created the idea of showing the dancers and all of their biometric data, which triggers wearables and some other um, uh, pipelines of data that we, you can access. Um, and then transplanting that ballet from the real theater into a virtual environment. And can you get the same emotional response? And can you understand it the same way by having this virtual but fully immersive experience? So there's current research on using uh, VR as, a, um, as an actual therapy. And it does work. It has an analgesic response of up to 48 hours. So can you imagine that for somebody who's taken, having to sign the drug book to get their drugs, which have huge side effects and actually limitations on you, to then having a VR clinical experience um, um, and how that's, of, of, in terms of the bioscience side of it, how that's really positive. I'm not sure I'd want an AI talking to me about it, though. I think I still want a human. Um, um, and again, we, you think if um, they might not understand it, but uh, they might be afraid of the technology, but it seems now that it's more likely to be used in a clinical setting if they've experienced it prior, which is why one of the reasons why we're doing this with the live ballet and the thing. Yeah. So again, talking about the open source stuff. So we use a lot of open source data um, in all of our projects. And the reason being is that we want other people to use them and make something better with them. So the idea in terms of, um, unfortunately, we do one, we do at the moment using the Daydream, which isn't open source, because uh, open source VR doesn't work on that yet. Um, but all of the other stuff is. 
Well, one of the challenges that we've had, because the dancers I use are from secondary school, is what, who, we record their biometric data, we've had permission from their parents and from the school to use uh, reacting to their wearables and some of the uh, data, visualizations, data visualizations that we use. Is, but we don't actually share any of that data with anyone other than mine. My biometric data will be available online afterwards for other people to use. And we, we spoke to the students, both the computing students and the dance students, about the ethics of who owns your data. Um, because we were talking about, you know, you've got your Apple Watch. Well, who can see that data? You can get that off by using a third-party app, and what can other people do with it? And again, going back to that, the, um, the AI saying that you're, um, you're he what, what spectrum you are on the, uh, uh, whether you're heterosexual or gay, it would then, if you terms of uh, me already, in terms of a chronic pain sufferer and somebody who's got a disability, I'm already at a disadvantage in society uh, because people don't see you and see you as less able and therefore less productive. So if you've got all of your biometric data and an AI saying, okay, you can have that job, you can go to that university, you can go to that, I definitely don't want that. So, and again, so it, there's some other interesting things going on. Um, it's a whole month long festival in Brighton called the Brighton Digital Festival. Just one of the things is my ballet and the VR experience. And it's really about introducing um, biosciences and the idea of having implanted technology um, to non-technical audiences um, and making it um, accessible but also in a way that they can understand it. So that's one of the challenges that we have at the moment is that I found that lang every one of you have used the word deep in a different way. We're very messy and lazy with our language and I think that's one of the things that make people afraid and, and, and scared and not able to understand what information you're trying to part. Um, so that's where I want to come from, is the idea of science communication to non-technical audiences. Thank you. <laughs> it is very different. <laughs> Thank you very much, Genevieve. And, um, and finally, we're going to hear from, from Maxine. And um, we're going to hear more about uh, what this kind of thing means for us as professionals. So. I mean, what we've seen today is kind of the coming together of lots of people that are working on kind of similar or um, related ideas. Um, and I guess a professional community, a professional culture. And it's something that has great, great potential um, if we build it in a kind of positive and sustainable way. And that's something Maxine really believes in, is going to talk to us more about. Bring uh, someone's wallet. Oh, that's probably mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to whiz through because I'm conscious that we're running out of time and be a bit nicer to chat than to hear more people speak. Um, so I'm just going to briefly whiz through um, uh, what we have to say about the next generation of healthy AIs. I'm sure there's a more erudite way of saying it, but um, you know, I'm here representing hopefully what is uh, the future of people who will be doing hopefully some interesting things at the intersection of AI and health. So I'm um, Technically, my day job is doing a PhD at UCL. Um, my side job is co-founder of One Health Tech, which is a national community and network that looks to get more women and people of diverse backgrounds in health innovation. Um, and if you want to chat to me about that more later, please do. We also have Rashmi at the back, um, who's involved with us, so do um, talk to either of us. Um, so I uh, did a, a, a range of different degrees, um, and I think this is quite demonstrative of the kind of people working at the intersection of kind of data and health. So I did neuroscience pharmacology, then um, basically thought scientists were a bit odd and autistic in many respects, so wanted to move right to the other side of social sciences and did a health economics master's. And I was really disillusioned with some of the um, uh, solutions that were being provided to health challenges. We were building all these economic models, and I just thought all of this is on the brink of, this is on the brink of changing, and we're not talking about digital health, we're not talking about personalised medicine. And a lot of these solutions are policy solutions, but how can tech provide that? Um, so, you know, thank you to, to some cookies. I, I got a good targeted ad for the PhD I'm currently doing. Um, and in the meantime, because of this illusion, I got really stuck into lots of different um, internships and jobs, and I was serially exploring uh, the commercial world, the policy world, the entrepreneurial world, and that, I think, has been hugely formative for the direction I've now taken. Um, but I've also got to be aware that I'm enormously privileged. So when people spend some of their weekends at Peppa Pig World, my dad was taking me to uh, particle accelerators in rural Oxfordshire. And I think that's something to bear in mind is that, you know, I have white, middle-class, Cambridge-educated PhD parents. Um, you know, 
dinner at my house is quite intense. And that's you know, enormously privileged. The world of science was never close to me. You know, if ever I wanted to go try something, my parents were right there behind me. So you know, it's, it's not a huge surprise what I'm going to end up doing. Um, you'll be pleased to know my sister has escaped all of the above. Um, she's a, a headhunter. Um, said with disdain. Um, but I just want to go through um, just four key pain points I think that the next generation of people working in this space um, are really considering and it's really worrying people and it's providing barriers for people. And I know a number of you in this room are working on elements of this, but the, I just want to go through the four main ones um, for me that are the pain points of the next generation. So one, uh, you know, I think Nav and I have probably read from the same hymn book. We've got family photos and memes galore now for the, for the graveyard shift of this event. But um, so the first thing is training. There's a huge number of thousands of life scientists and other scientists are now graduating from university not having the skills they need to really be at the frontier of where science is. Um, I didn't write a single line of code throughout my entire neuroscience and pharmacology degree at UCL. And I appreciate there are some initiatives happening, you know, complex. Um, I know that Benevolent AI is looking to, uh, has created a working group to get those life scientists to come together. But fundamentally, this world of tech and data was never open to me and never exposed to me when I was an undergraduate. And I think that though there are some schemes happening on the edges, there isn't a fundamental change happening in how we're educating scientists now at university. Um, and as a result, you know, what it is the, to be accredited with that is changing. A lot of us are doing Coursera's, a lot of us are doing meetups and coding groups. I personally learned to code through an initiative called Code First Girls, which looks to get um, uh, more women working, yeah, it's a good meme, isn't it? Um, it looks to get more women working in coding, and it's uh, a weekly after university club. It's predominantly based around pizza and beer. You write a couple of lines of shitty Python. But the point is that it completely demystifies the whole process of learning how to code. And that's how I learned. And there are so many people um, now having these roundabout routes because they're trying to plug the gaps that the formal systems aren't providing them. Um, and certainly with One Health Tech, we fought very hard for a woman who was smashing lots of Kaggle competitions, but she couldn't get a job because she didn't have a degree in computer science. The third thing, and I have to, I spent a lot of my time talking about this, um, is the diversity agenda. So um, it's, I know it's a shocking photo for many of you. You probably haven't seen this photo before. It's the, the lesser spotted cue for the men's loos. Um, and this was a deep learning and healthcare conference. And uh, you know, it's both a beautiful photo because I didn't have to cue, but also it's a quite a good, I think, barometer for how your diversity is at a conference. Um, and the reality is that it is important that we have you know, more women working in this field. It is important that we have more people who you know, are maybe less able. It is more important that you have people from different backgrounds, be it anthropologists, be it artists, because without making the whole field a bit more open, and we've talked about this time and time again, the lack of common language, the lack of um, bringing together, together all the disciplines you need for this very interdisciplinary field is very important. And I think that though I'd, for me, I didn't suffer from the lack of female role models, I had hardcore parents. I know lots of people are less fortunate that, than that. And a lack of female, certainly, in this, in this field does trickle down and does have a negative effect. And then the last but not least, um, and this is a question that, I mean, John's getting name-checked all the time today, but you know, John asked this at, um, at a conference, uh, and it's incentives. Uh, I get paid 16 grand a year to do a PhD, and I have to live in London, and I have to support myself. And there are thousands of PhDs in the same position. And every now and then when I feel a little bit sorry for myself, I look at what DeepMind could be paying me to do exactly the same methods and my eyes or water. And there is something really serious to think about this, that you know, my peers would much rather work on big societal problems, get rewarded financially, be part of a team that's having real world impact, that's not publishing, um, and, and you know, your impact is not based on your, your impact factor. And I just think that we do need to think very seriously about how to incentivize the next generation, because you can't compete on salaries anymore. It's now just too warped um, an imbalance. And then we have to think about how to um, encourage people based on things like quality of life, based on lifestyle, based on IP, and, and try to be a bit more intelligent in how we incentivize people to stick in academia or in the public sector and not necessarily go to the oligopoly that we've um, talked about so much. So those are the kind of four things um, and the pain points, I think, for the next generation of health and data people. Um, and I'm sure many of you are working on various bits of solutions in all those areas, but we can discuss that in a panel, I'm sure. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm very conscious that we're reaching the end of the day. Um, I will take any 
absolutely burning questions now, but I strongly encourage everyone uh, to join for the drinks reception afterwards <laughs> and ask your questions there um, in a bit more of a casual environment where we can really start arguing with each other. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, are there any, any questions that you'd really like to put to one or more of the panelists um, before we start to wrap up? I just want to get boozed. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> or, or we've solved it. Oh, here we go. I'll ask you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm sure most people know about the Gartner hype curve. Um, in the 2016 hype curve, um, cognitive computing and intelligent assistance were at the top of the curve, i.e., they were about to, if you believe in the curve, crash into the, into the valley of despond or whatever it's called. <clears throat> um, and uh, we, some of us experienced a couple of AI winters before. I noticed over the last six months with IBM getting an increasingly bad press and quite a few other things happening that um, maybe there is actually a, a pendulum swinging rather faster um, against the, the, the positives, only to recover, one hopes. Um, but I wonder how many people have shared that observation that, the, that over the last few months the, the press for AI is getting a little bit more critical. Black boxes and all that. <coughs> Yeah, any response to that? Is public opinion about to turn? <laughs> Anyone? Well, I, I mean, we all I, agree. I, I, it's pretty negative. Go, go. Yeah, no, I'm saying the press is pretty negative about it, but yeah, it doesn't mean that it's um, gonna have, uh, gonna make any difference to what the big major companies are doing, though. That's the only problem. That's the kind of even though the press is saying all these negative things, they tend to sort of live on their own rules. So. Well, there is this movement now for um, you know benevolent AI which has had a couple of meetings, and MIRI is one of the institutions involved, but it's not the only one. And it's largely funded by, you know, dot-com millionaires like um, Jan Pollan, for example. Canyon, rather, Jan Canyon. Um, and Elon Musk. And so people in the, in the area are waking up to some of the problems and some of the criticisms. In my cynical moments, which I think on this topic are fairly many, I think this is because they foresee their funding drying up because of the sort of thing that John was, was talking about, the sort of critiques that are coming. But anyway, there, there is not just talk about it, but money. I mean, for example, a couple of years ago, Elon Musk went to the first conference of this type and coughed up 18 million. Well, I mean, to him it's nothing, but I mean, coughed up 18 million to be given as research money a, to people who were writing new gizmos, perhaps, but gizmos that were transparent or could be provably safe in certain ways. So they were trying to write good AI gizmos rather than possibly harmful AI gizmos. But also a lot of the money was put aside and has already been given to people who aren't writing gizmos at all, people who aren't AI people, people who are interested in the philosophical, ethical, legal, moral, social implications of AI, uh, and not least AI and the military and so on. So, so that money, I mean, it's not that people weren't doing that work before, they were, but they, most of them, they weren't getting money for it, they were just doing it. There wasn't any money to be had. But now there is that amount of money, well, there's more. There, there, is, there are bits of money, quite a lot of it actually, in total coming from the community itself. So I hope that that makes a difference to, the, to what they, they, they're actually doing, but. I mean, just to pick up on, on Navin's point, uh, Babylon, snake oil of digital health. I mean, the guys literally built a company based on lies, and I'm completely okay with publicly saying that, and I really appreciate that you have as well. You know, the CQC has come out and said they are unethical and immoral, and there is no evidence. They have, they have written an independent review that is not randomly controlled. When they were challenged, they just removed the name independent, and all the authors are from Babylon. I mean, it is a just mind-boggling, really terrible science. And you just think that if companies like that are winning contracts with the NHS and they've just gone to Digital Health but London Accelerator, we should be really worried. So, yeah, I think that, um, you know, the odd article in the BMJ stating them is, uh, seems to be falling on deaf ears. So I think we need to find a slightly better way to shout about bad science. I feel like it's like a Ben Goldacre moment. It needs, <laughs> it needs like bad digital health 2.0 or something. <laughs> the, the, the only thing I want to add is I think the... the 
curve is going to come down when you hit harder problems. So with any new technology, you, you hit the low-hanging fruit and you show promise. And usually people extrapolate what we'll be able to do in X years. And you've started dealing with all that easy coded, well, numerical data that's easy to analyze. And now you're going to get to the hard stuff and you're not going to succeed as well. And then the shine will come off. What a way to end. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. The only thing I'd add to that, and this is really my bread and butter, is that when we talk about things like public opinion, the public is, is a huge group, and there are many, many public opinions, and probably the, the voices that we're hearing are the ones that are engaged, and that's maybe 20% of the population. There's a whole lot of people that probably would could be, could really benefit and could really benefit from having their voice heard and from having people like us reach out to them a bit more um, and and find out what it is that really matters to them about this stuff. homework <laughs> <laughs> actually I was going to do it at the end of this but yeah um, so so what I would do and it's a challenge I said to all of my students and I teach kids who are from age four all the way up to I did wearable technology with seamstress who's, who was 70 and that is in a single tweet with no video including the hashtag using correct English grammar so in your 140 characters define the term AI to a 12 year old it's very hard, but yeah. Because there is, what, 50 different definitions of AI? So how could you explain what AI is to somebody who's 12? Again, using no video, that's my challenge, extra challenge to you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but, yeah, but you're allowed to use an image or multiple images. But yeah, but I'd say, you, so in the next couple of days, see if you can do that. Because actually one of the ways that we engage with students is through social media and things like that, and it's one of the ways that they communicate all the time. So if you, can, if you can engage and make your language accessible to them, then they will more likely engage back with you and give you a very different response to what you are normally getting in your um, professional spheres. Home works I would, I would say that the uh, public engagement, when it comes to academic terms, is quite interesting. It's public engagement for many academics seems to be doing kitsch poems dressed up as a dinosaur in a pub to a room of academics. You know, that's not really public engagement. Um, and so I would definitely encourage um, you know, everyone to go to the big media outlets and, and you know, have your voice heard. You know, pitch something to The Guardian, pitch something to Huffington Post. Um, I was randomly called up for Radio 4 to do eight minutes. 8.3 million people listen to me talk about AI for eight minutes. That's the sort of scale that, you know, the voice you can kind of start to get out if you go to the right outlets. So I definitely encourage you to, to proactively go to, you know, where people are reading. And that can be the Daily Mail. In fact, I encourage you to go to the Daily Mail. <laughs> I think I should just shut up, really. <laughs> Everything I've said here is as a counterpoint. So you can see from the start that I actually, I'm not that pessimistic, but I think what I want is for people to have both sides of the conversation. Because out in the media, quite, quite often, the, the narrative's driven by people with an interest in AI. So you only tend to hear one side of the story. So I tend to go hard the other way just to, to balance it. But I'm not that bad, honestly. <laughs> Margaret, do you have anything to? Yeah, I have a question, please. OK, so if there's one thing you were going to, you could suggest to, um, to engage the public in this issue, what? What would you say for each people in this, each of the people in this room, to do? Well, the sort of thing that, uh, largely thanks to you and your colleagues, went on last week in um, in Brighton, the British Science Festival, which included a number. I mean, there was one, I think, only one session which was technically about AI, but there were other sessions that actually involved relevant issues. So. People, you know, people getting, as you said, getting to the general public, including youngsters, very importantly youngsters, and yes, talking about it in intelligible terms and, and communicating the excitement, because it's hugely exciting, hugely interesting, as well as being, in various areas, hugely worrying. And, you know, get, getting rid of the hype. <laughs> exactly. We're all, we're all just people, right? That's, 
that's a, that's a good I don't know. There. <laughs> so on that, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm sure actually going to pass over to, to Jackie to wrap up the day. And, um, and thank you all um, for, for sticking with us. And thank you to the panelists. And of course, uh, thank you um, for our amazing hosts. It's been great to be here.